seated. Good morning. Glad you're, you're all here. Um, we are going to be wrapping up the book of Acts. We've been studying the book of Acts for several months, and hopefully you've been reading along with the story. And uh, so we're going to be in Acts chapter 27 here in just a moment. Uh, so you can turn there in your Bibles if you want to. Um, before we do that, I have an announcement, kind of uh, one of the things that's going to be happening here at Grace Trigger or Treat. Uh, here at Grace, we're always looking for ways to reach more people, uh, to grow, to expand, to uh, spread the gospel uh, and help people. And so we're actually going to be launching a Thursday night church service uh, this fall. So uh, think about that, pray about that. Uh, so after Labor Day in September, we're going to start with every week on Thursday night, we're going to have church. It's going to be the same as what's going to happen on Sunday, the coming Sunday morning. Uh, so it's an option for people. Uh, one of the things we've been thinking about is uh, there's a lot of people that work, uh, travel, are gone on weekends. Uh, it's difficult to be consistent in getting to church. And so uh, we're going to do that as an option for people. And hopefully even people that you can invite, maybe think about people in your life uh, that have a hard time getting to church or that might consider coming on a Thursday instead of a Sunday. Um, we're going to do some practice runs this summer. So uh, starting in June, on June 13th, uh, so it's going to be the second Thursday of June, July, and August, we're going to do a church service uh, in here. So uh, our student ministries meet on Thursday. That's going to continue. So middle school and high school, uh, they'll sometimes come to worship here and then go to their small group uh, afterwards. Uh, this fall, we're actually going to add a, a community meal. So We've got an agreement with the Lutheran Church across the street. We're going to use their building. We're going to have a free community meal that you can invite people to. You can come with your family uh, at 6 to 7, and then at 7 o'clock, come over here for church. Or you can drop your kids off. They can do the kids' programming, and uh, you can go on a date or something. Uh, so just something that we're going to try uh, through the rest of the year. So start praying about that. Uh, if you feel called to help with that, we would love uh, for you to get connected. We're looking to build a team of people to help us with that. Uh, but we really have a heart to, to reach our community, and so that's one other, one way that we can do that together here at Grace Church. So Thursday night church, right? Help spread the word. How many of you guys love weather? Like you've got the weather app, you watch the weather channel all the time. Every day you're checking your phone. You Like some of you guys for work, you know, it's just a natural thing. Or if you're a hunter or a fisher or so stuff like that, you're always looking. Like you love to talk about the weather. Like, what, what's your favorite app? I have the Weather Channel. Any others? AccuWeather. There you go. The radar, all that kind of stuff. So we love the weather. There's some people that are really obsessed with it, though. Uh, have you ever heard of storm chasers? Yeah. Yeah, so Austin Weaver, is, like, he comes to church here, and uh, he's a storm chaser. So, like, he goes out west and, like, like follows the storm, takes videos and pictures and stuff like that. So... Uh, that's an extreme thing. So in, in chapter 27 of Acts, this is the storm. This is this incredible storm. This is Paul, the apostle, is traveling. He's been uh, planting churches. Uh, the, the story has been about Paul the last several weeks. Uh, Paul is uh, called by God. He, he had an encounter with Jesus, radically transformed his life, and now he is spreading the gospel. He's planting churches all over that region. Uh, he's investing in discipling people, uh, and this is like another journey. And so he he is uh, on his way to, to Rome in this story. Now, Paul had been warned to not go to Jerusalem. If you've been reading the story here, there's many people that said, hey, you shouldn't go back to Jerusalem because you'll probably be arrested, you might be persecuted, you might be killed, they're plotting against you, they're trying to stop this movement of Jesus, and yet he still goes against their advice because he feels like that's what God is telling him to do. So he goes there, and sure enough, there's a, a, an uprising. People are, are uh, committed to stopping him. He gets arrested. He gets put on trial for uh, over three different leaders try him. They don't really find anything wrong against their laws, and so they're having a hard time like convicting him. And so he sits in jail year after year. And finally, he says, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. I'm going to appeal to Caesar. And they say, okay, fine. That's, that's kind of the end of chapter 26. And we move now into chapter 27. He's appealed to Caesar, and he's on his way to Rome. So 
the reason that, that Paul is so confident, I think um, one of the, the reasons is because he does feel this calling of God. And God has confirmed it several times in his life. If you look back into chapter 23 of Acts, uh, there was this, this uprising, this uh, actually a riot that broke out. And things were going completely crazy, and they pull Paul out to kind of uh, save his life, put him in prison to save his life. And he was visited by the Lord, and this is what it says. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. So God gives him this, this confirmation that he's to go to Rome. Like that's his destination uh, where he's going to have a platform of some sort to continue to spread the gospel. Now, we know what happens. He goes there and he writes all of these letters uh, from prison and impacting us big time uh, with Scripture. And so he has this, this confidence, this, um, this assurance that God is with him. And that's how we start chapter 27. Paul is on a ship. He's headed for Rome. Uh, this journey is very detailed uh, because Luke, who's the writer, is on the ship with him. So he's detailing this entire trip, this storm that comes up, all the, the little details that we'll look at. But there's also some really good spiritual takeaways for us about storms. We all have storms in our life, right? Like you've been through, some of you have been through terrible storms. Some of you will be through terrible storms at some point in your life. And so there's some real good spiritual takeaways for us. Now, Paul's whole life was really a storm. If you think about the turmoil that he's been through, one right after another. And doesn't it feel that way? Sometimes you come out of a storm and... You think, oh, smooth waters for a little bit here, right? And then sure enough, something happens. And sometimes they're quick uprising, quick storms, and sometimes they're long, drawn-out, difficult storms. Every human being faces heartache and trouble and difficulty, all of us. Job 5.7 says this, Yet man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly up. If you're sitting around a campfire, what happens when the sparks fly? They go up, right? Just like that, we're, we're, we're assured we're going to have some trouble. Jesus said it like this. He said, he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Through every, everyone experiences trouble is the point here. And we as believers, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's an additional trouble. Because there's an enemy that is going to do everything he can to oppose Jesus, and that means you. And so there's this element of spiritual warfare uh, just in the world around us that makes it even more difficult at times to weather the storm. So Paul understood this, and so as he traveled and as he preached and as he invested time with people, he knew that he was not on a playground, but he was on a battleground. And I think that's how we should view our lives, too. You know, sometimes we feel like it's a playground and we're having fun and things are going great, but we have to remember that this is a battleground, too. So let's dive in. Acts 27, verses uh, 1 through 12. I'm going to read the first 12 verses. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship from Adrimotilum, about to sail for port along the coast of the province of Asia. And we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a, Ma a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go with his friends so that they might provide for his needs. So that would be Luke and Aristarchus with him. From there we put out to sea again and passed to the Lee of Cyprus, along the wind, because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea, off the coast of Sicilia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. So this is in the, in the area of Greece, if you can picture in modern-day Greece. Um, there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship, so that was from Egypt, uh, sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. So all of these, these prisoners transferred over to this big ship. 
We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Snidus when the wind did not allow us to hold our course. We sailed to the Lee of Crete, opposite of Salmon. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Haven near the town of Lycia. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous, because now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and cargo, and to our own lives as well. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. So Paul is traveling to Rome on this ship. They, they go on this big grain ship from Egypt that they put all of these prisoners. There's 270 people, by the way, on this ship. So this is no small ship. This is a big ship. It's packed. It's got all of this cargo and all of these people. Uh, it's a ship that is probably pretty sturdy, but also very difficult to navigate. Uh, they wouldn't have had a rudder. It would have had some big oars uh, to try to help navigate it a little bit. So that's the kind of ship that, that we find ourselves on here. And Paul uh, actually has some friends there with him, which is unusual as a prisoner. Uh, so that tells you that he had favor, that God was watching out for him, that God allowed the, these people to come with him to, to help him along the way. Now, there's an old Jewish saying that applies here. Man makes plans, and God laughs. Has that been true in your life? You know, you make all of these plans, and it seems like it doesn't go as planned. That there's a, there's a detour, or there's something that completely changes. And I think this is so interesting. Paul thinks he's going to Rome as a missionary, and God sends him there as a prisoner. He didn't have to raise any money, right? <laughs> like, he's a prisoner, so they're, they're like putting the bill to send him to Rome. Not a great way to go, but God does that sometimes. Now, we see here that they transfer to another ship. It's headed to Italy. Uh, and this time of the year is also pretty important. It's late October. And so this is the time where the weather starts to change. In that region, it, even today, it becomes very violent. Some of these storms can pop up very quickly. And Paul had traveled this area over and over and over again. So he knew that this was a dangerous time. And so he warns them very clearly, hey, guys, we, we shouldn't do this. We're probably going to lose the ship, and we could lose our lives, and we could stay right here. But they decide, no, you're a prisoner. Why should we listen to you? You know, the captain and the pilot and the owner of the ship were like, nope, we've got to get there. Uh, we got to get to this different port. It's, it's not very far. It'll be okay so that we can winter there. It's much nicer, lots more to do. Let's go there. And so off they go. Now, they don't take Paul's advice, but they find out that something bad does happen. And I want to talk to you about storms. I want to give you three biblical principles about storms. And every one of us have had storms. The first one is this. Storms change our comfort. Storms get us out of our comfort zone, right? Let's, let's look at verses 13 through 15. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they take off. They weighed anchor and they sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Nor'easters of swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so they gave way to it and were driven along. Storms change our comfort. Very quickly, this crew and this ship was in this incredible storm, hurricane force wind that, that took this ship and just wherever the wind blows is where they're going. They couldn't control it. And so storms get us out of our comfort zone. You know, that's why we hate storms is because it takes us away from our comfort. We like to be comfortable, right? We all have our things that make us feel good, that make us feel safe. And yet a storm 
there's nothing safe about a storm. You know, even though Paul was in the will of God, there was still difficulty and danger. So even when you're following Christ and you're doing your best, when you're you're working hard to, to do the right thing, storms still come. Difficulties still hit us. And this is definitely a dangerous situation. It's a difficult situation for Paul, but it was needed. And sometimes you and I need to get out of our comfort zone. And sometimes it takes a storm. Because on our own, we resist making a change, or we resist maybe what uh, taking a risk that God is wanting us to take. And sometimes that, that storm shakes us enough to get out of our comfort zone. A physical example would be exercise. If you don't uh, use your muscles, if you don't exercise some, if you don't move much, you start to get flattened. You start to get weaker. Right? I mean, that's just the reality. And if there isn't some resistance, then our physical body starts to, to deteriorate even more. And sometimes we can get what we call into a rut. Right? Back in the pioneer days, there was these trails that would go out west, and uh, they would get into these muddy situations, and the wheels of the, the carts would, would cause a rut. And they would actually put signs up that if you get in this rut, now you're going to be in it for the next 25 miles. <laughs> so the point was, like, don't get in that rut if you're going to want to pull off because you can't. Our lives can be like that, right? We can get stuck in a rut. could be physically. You know, it could be mentally. could be spiritually. And when we get into a rut, uh, it's, it's when we're used to the things that, like, like they've always been. And sometimes we just need to do something different. Maybe it's exercising, eating right, that we feel better, we have more energy, we're stronger. Mentally, maybe it's reading books and listening to podcasts and messages and stretching your mind a little bit so that you could, your mind is, is working, memorizing scriptures spiritually. You can exercise spiritually. It's your prayer life. It's reading God's Word. It's studying it. It's memorizing it. It's using your spiritual gifts to serve the Lord. It's, it's so following the promptings of the Holy Spirit and taking some risks spiritually, having some conversations. Those are the things that exercise us spiritually, and we can get out of that rut. But sometimes the storm helps us to kind of get beyond and get to what God really has for us. You know, some of you know that I was a banker uh, back in the day. I met, I met a guy this morning, and he said, hey, I remember you from the bank. It's like, wow, that, that was a long time ago. But uh, that transition for me was a bit of a storm. So God is calling me to ministry. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confused. I'm feeling a little bit like Paul. You know, he's called me to do something, and yet I don't know how to get there. And I'm supposed to preach the word, but I'm a business guy. And so God starts moving me, and I, I get into God's word a lot, and uh, all of a sudden I find myself transitioning jobs. The job I thought I was going to go to fell through. And now I don't have a job. And so there's a lot of confusion and uh, kind of a storm. Like, what's next, God, really? You know, you, you asked me to start moving this direction, and this is what happened. Some of you can relate to that. You know, maybe you got laid off from a job, or maybe uh, something happened that you lost your job, or maybe there was a financial crisis. And it really changed my comfort. It, it got me uh, thinking about something different, though. It allowed me to pursue what God really had for me. And for the next couple of years, he prepared me for ministry through the job that I did get. He opened up a door I never would have pursued if it wouldn't have happened that the other job fell through. So sometimes, on the other side of that storm, or of that difficult situation, or something that we feel like, like, why God would you do this to me? There's something so much bigger and better that's available for you. The other thing that storms do is it changes your values. Storms change your values. This one is so important. Listen to verses 16 through 20. So they're continuing on. It says, As we passed the lee of a small island called Caudia, 
We were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure, so the men placed it at a board. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. They would have sent divers underneath with ropes in the storm to, like, secure the boat. Can you imagine? Because they were afraid that they would run aground on the sandbars of Cyprus. They didn't know where they were, so they knew these sandbars were out there, so they were trying to shore up the boat. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued to rage, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. So they would have navigated by the stars, and if you couldn't see the stars, you can't navigate. So they, they were not able to navigate. They didn't know where they were at. Isn't that how a storm is sometimes? You don't know where you're at. You don't know where you're headed. There, there's fear starts to drip. You, you heard the, the fear there. Like, what are we going to do? Oh, no, we're going to die. Like, we've got to do something. And here they're preparing the ship. They're battening down the hatches. Uh, they're preparing for this storm. And yet, the storm disorients them. And they're on this wild ride. Now, here they can't run and hide from it, so they have to try to face the storm. And that's oftentimes what we have to do. It gets to the place where, okay, I just got to face this. I got to try to do the best that I can. And we try to, on our own, figure it out. But then if you notice here, their priorities started to change. They started throwing stuff off the ship, right? They they were throwing some of the the stuff they were hauling that they were going to get money for. And we'll find out later if you read the rest of the story. They threw all the grain overboard. Like that was the the, the money they were going to make. They started throwing all the stuff they brought with them, all their furniture, all their beds, like everything was gone. And so a, a point here is that in a storm, we should toss out what really doesn't matter. We should, we should toss out what won't help us survive. When a storm hits you hard, suddenly that paycheck that you thought was so important isn't quite as important. You know, in a storm, we suddenly realize that what's really important in our life is not stuff. It's not money and possessions. It's people. It's relationships. It's God. That's the priority. And so it changes our values. There's a story that I just recently read. Uh, There's a country singer called Granger Smith. Anybody hear of Granger Smith? Yeah. Super popular. Uh, But back in 2019... Uh, Granger's son, River, drowned in their family pool. They were having a, just a, a great time, and all of a sudden, it got, he said it got quiet, more quiet than normal, and he starts looking for his son, and sure enough, he's in there. And they try to save him, and they take him to the hospital, and um, they, they had some hope for just a little bit, and then the doctor said there's zero chance he'll ever survive. So can you imagine the storm that they're in? This this tragic event that just uh, devastates their life. They lose their son, River. And they go through this up and down storm. And Granger, uh, shortly after that, he goes back on tour. He's probably trying to forget that. And and he's on tour. and, And yet he hits this low point in his life where... He feels like the only way out is to take his life. And he actually had a gun, and he put it in his mouth. And he was hearing these voices tell him that this was the only way. And in that moment, he cried out to Jesus. He said, I, I, out loud, I said, Jesus, help me right now. I need your help. It's gone. Put the gun down. Everything changed. That, that was a turning point for him. And what he did, his values started to change. His, his priorities started to change. He gave up country music. I don't know if you knew that, but he stopped going on tour. He entered seminary. He wrote a book about this whole experience, and he's sharing the gospel. He's sharing Jesus with people uh, from a tragic, incredibly difficult storm. He's helping people to make a difference. You can look it up. There's a great interview that he did. Uh, on a podcast a friend shared with me just this week. 
it's incredible what God is doing through something as tragic as that. So it changes our values. Proverbs 11, 4, 11, 4 says this, Wealth is worthless in the days of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. The last thing that uh, storms do is it brings out the best in you or the worst in you. Now, usually it's both. If you've been through a difficult time, probably some ugly stuff came out of you. And that, that typically happens because, you know, we don't know what to do with it. And so sometimes the bad stuff in us does come out, but also the good stuff can come out too. The best can come out of you in a storm. Let's look what happens here. Verse uh, 21. After they had gone a long time without food, they were probably seasick, I would imagine, uh, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep your courage, because none of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night an angel of, of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage. Men, have faith in God that this will happen just as he has told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. So Paul here tells them, I told you so, right? <laughs> you like how he did that? He rubbed that in? He probably wasn't rubbing it in. He probably was saying, okay, guys, you didn't listen to me before, but you should listen to me now. So he's got some credibility because what he said actually happened. And so he says, guys, listen to me now. That I've heard from the Lord. And so a good point here for all of us is to seek wise counsel. Like when you're in a storm, who are you listening to? Who are you talking to? Are you talking to godly people? Are you seeking God's word? Or are you listening to other people who have great advice? And oftentimes that advice goes along with our society and, and what, what would make sense. But usually that's not God's way. God's way and our way are so much different. God's heart and our heart are different. And so sometimes going against some of those impulses like, yeah, this is what I should do. Is we should really do the opposite. But who are you talking to? What counsel are you getting? In times of storm, we need strong Christian leaders to lead. When there's a difficulty and everyone's burned out and paralyzed by fear or panicking, a leader arises. The storm brought out the best in Paul. You know, he, he shares that the Lord had appeared to him through a messenger, and he shares that with them. And here it is. I want you to get this. The metal of a man or woman is tested in difficulty. If you want to find out who a person is, just listen to them and watch them and observe them during a trial or a difficult time. That's when a person's true character is revealed. So when you're, you're observing someone going through a storm, like, what's coming out? You know, I've seen some people that are facing cancer or some incredibly difficult situations, and the way that they handle themselves and the attitude that they have and their trust and, and love of the Lord just comes out of them. What a great witness in those moments. So why, why was Paul able to stay so calm in the storm? I want to give you three anchors, because they, they drop anchor. You'll read, read about this. They drop three, I think four anchors, to try to stop themselves from slamming into the reefs or whatever. And uh, I think historically those anchors were found. Uh, it's pretty cool. They're somewhere today. Um, but I want to give you some anchors that we can go to in, in these times of storm. The first one is the anchor of our identity. Our identity. Look at what he says here. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong. Paul says, I belong to God. Do you belong to God? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Is he your Lord and Savior? Have you made that decision? If you have, then you have a new identity. You're not just who you were. You are a child of God. You're adopted into the family. You are fully accepted 
completely loved. That's your identity. That's who you are. You're no longer the person you were before. You have a new heart. He's transforming you. And when you understand your identity in Christ, it changes your perspective on every storm. You start to see it a little bit differently. You handle it differently. You think differently. Now you have an eternal perspective. You know where you're going to go when you pass away from this world to the next. You see people differently because you see them as a soul that God loves and not just this annoying person that I can't hardly stand. It changes who you are. So hanging on to your true identity in a storm is so important. The other thing that, uh, the other anchor is the anchor of service. Another word that I like there is worship. Another translation uses worship here. It says, and whom I serve stood beside me. So Paul is on a mission from God. I love that. It's almost like, like you know, the, the Blues Brothers. Um, but he's on a mission from God. He knows who he belongs to. Do you know who you belong to? If you do, then you are on mission from God. You are on mission from God. And when you're on mission from God, your life becomes worship. As Zach was talking about earlier, your priority is the Lord. And so every part of your life is worship. It's service. It's serving God. It could be in your job. Your work should be worship, a way of serving the Lord. Your family, your relationships, the way you handle your money, the way that you uh, treat people, the way that you, uh, your personal life, your hobbies, all of those things are ways that we worship and serve. You know, Paul believed, in, as we should, that when you're on mission from God and he has an assignment for you, that he protects you through the storm. See, none of us know when our time is up. Only God knows when our time is up. And until our time is up, we are to serve. We are to serve, the kid, serve God in his kingdom. He's given all of us gifts and abilities and experiences that have shaped us to make a difference. Sometimes it's in just small ways. Sometimes it's just being kind. Taking the time for someone. There's so many ways that we serve in the kingdom. And so when we're in a storm, think about serving. Think about worshiping in the storm. There's a great song about that. We worship in the storm. The last one is this, the anchor of our faith. Another word there is trust. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Paul trusted God's word. He, he, do you trust God's word? Even when it doesn't make sense? When we trust him, it changes everything. So Abraham Lincoln uh, was president during one of the darkest times in our history, the Civil War. Uh, talk about a storm. Our whole country was in turmoil, uh, brother against brother, and it was it's just a nasty time, and he was the leader. And it was said that, that uh, Abraham Lincoln had a Bible on his desk, and he, just, he didn't have it on there just for show. He looked at it often. He opened that Bible. He went to the Bible for wisdom and discernment. And after he was killed, uh, they, they took that Bible and were looking through it. And on one of the, in, in the book of Psalms, there was a place where there was this smudge mark. And they were trying to figure out, like, why that's so worn. And it looked like he laid his finger down on this one particular passage. And he must have done it repeatedly because it was smudged and worn. And it was Psalm 34, 4. That's what it says. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fear. Put yourself in his shoes. He's seeking the Lord. Like, what do you do in, in a situation sometimes that there's just not a win-win? He said, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fear. It's a promise. See, God is a promise keeper. And when you trust him, trust his promises, that's when he gets you through your storms and he gets you on to things bigger and better and more amazing. 
the enemy also has some anchors, some ways to, to battle against us in these storms. One of the tactics is lies. There are so many lies that we believe that cause us to stay stuck in a storm or to make the storm worse. So ask yourself, what lies am I believing? Maybe about myself, maybe about God, maybe about the world around us. But what lies, and oftentimes it comes through uh, our life experiences, previous storms. Something was planted in you that's not true, and you believe it. When you're set free from that, when you know your true identity, that's why identity uh, offsets lies, truth of your identity. Another one would be doubt. When you believe lies, all of a sudden you start to doubt, which causes fear, which is another one. And when we're doubtful, when we're fearful, we're stuck in the storm. That's why uh, faith and worship and service and all of those things that I talked about are so important in the storm to do those things because the enemy wants to keep you stuck in the storm. He wants to take you out during that time. So let's finish the story. Verse 27. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. When about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were approaching land. They took soundings and found the water uh, was 100 feet, 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. So they're getting closer to shore. Fearing that they would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboats down to the sea, pretending uh, they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the rope that held the lifeboat, lifeboat and it drifted away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in a constant suspense and have gone without food, and you haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You will need it to survive. Not, not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of all of them. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves, although they were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the rest of the grain into the sea. You can see Paul's leadership here, right? You know, he's confident. He's telling them, hey, you guys are going to make it. Let's eat this kind of meal together. He prays. He brings that spiritual element into that moment. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay and a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that had held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the turf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent them from uh, swimming away, because the prisoners escaped, the, the soldiers themselves would be killed. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. Isn't that amazing? All 276 made it. They get on shore. God's promise happens. Everyone survived this storm and made it to shore. God will get you through the storm. It may be a struggle. You may have to swim for it. You may have to hold on to a piece of wood for a while. But he'll get you there. And one of the amazing things, if you keep reading this story, uh, I wish I could preach about uh, uh, chapter 28, but they get on shore, and it's cold and nasty, and there's all these people come, and, and it's, it's, I think Malta is the name of this uh, little place. And uh, so they're, they're gathered around, and uh, that they're building a fire, and they're going to get some food and stuff like that. And sure enough, what happens? He goes to 
the Paul is gathering sticks. He's a servant. Like, he's out there working just like everybody else. And a snake bites him. Like, this viper comes up and latches onto his hand. And all the people of the, the island are like, oh, that must be karma. You know, he must be a bad man, and he's going to die. You know, they, he's got, probably going to swell up and, and die because they were watching him. Well, he just shook it off. The snake, you know, shook off the snake into the fire and went on, and nothing happened. Then they thought he was a god. They said, he must be a god if he survived that. And it gave him an opportunity to share the gospel with these people. So right from one storm to another, Paul used, used that as a way to spread the gospel. So think about in the midst of a storm, God might want you to be that example to someone else about who Jesus is. So always keep that in mind, that people are watching and that we can make a difference. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this incredible story of Paul and his journey and the storm. And so many of us have storms in our life that we face, and it can be difficult and hard and painful, and yet you are with us. And so thank you for the reminder that uh, sometimes when we get out of our comfort zone that you've got something bigger and better that you're working on us, that you're uh, developing us, that you're helping us. God, I pray that you would help us to sink into those anchors that you've given to us, our true identity in Christ, that we would live that out that we would know who we are and who we belong to. Lord, I pray that you would help us to serve you and worship you, that you would be that main priority uh, in our life, that we would be consistent in that. And that, Lord, that you would continue to bring out the best in us, that you would refine us, that you would help us to shine brightly for you. Lord, we're so grateful for uh, what, you, uh, what you've done and what you're going to do. Lord, I pray that uh, the people that are here, that are listening, that have heard this story, that whenever that storm comes, that we would look to you. That we wouldn't look to other things, that we would seek you with all of our heart. That you would give us strength and wisdom and courage for that journey. So that we can get on the other side of that, so we can continue to serve you. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, next week we start a new series, uh, Everyday Disciple Makers. We're going to talk about what it means to be a disciple, to follow Jesus. Uh, so this whole summer, uh, we're going to be doing that. I encourage you to try to be here every Sunday. I know summer's challenging that way. If you miss any of the messages, watch them online. We post the video uh, usually uh, the day after. Uh, watch those so you can keep tracking with us on uh, this teaching. So I'm excited about it. Uh, we're going to teach about the four chairs of discipleship. Uh, so you'll be hearing more about that in the days ahead. God bless you guys. Have a good rest of the day. Good uh, day off tomorrow. And we'll see you next Sunday.